everyone, and welcome to The Hash, where we bring you the latest and greatest in crypto and culture. My name is Naomi Brockwell. We have Jen Sinassi, we have Christy Hawk, and we have Zach Seward. We're going to be diving into all the things, and I'm going to kick this straight off to Zach. What's going on with this giant, giant article that was posted <laughs> in Coindesk about Manusha? Dig into all the details. What's the TLDR? Well, we filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and we got something like 230 pages worth of internal documents from the Trump administration regarding its crypto policy. Sometimes you file a FOIA and it works. In this instance, it worked. It's a really interesting perspective and portrait of Trump era crypto policy and what materialized from it was ultimately not much, but there are lots of details and color in these documents that really show who was leading the conversation around digital currencies within the White House. Uh, a lot of good tro a lot of good nuggets in here. This was really a treasure trove uh, uh, that we had obtained through a FOIA request. Uh, so you can go any number of ways with this one. Lots of good gems that stood out to me. But I'm going to toss this straight back to you, Naomi, for your initial thoughts. Yeah, well, I thought it was interesting in that it kind of describes Mnuchin as being not really involved in crypto too much until right at the very end when he passed all that disastrous legislation. Like, I think there was a quote from Jerry Brusso in there about how, you know, Mnuchin wasn't really, he didn't really do anything terrible until he did the most terrible thing, which was basically try to add reporting requirements, crazy overreaching reporting requirements for non-custodial wallets. I mean, I remember in the early days of Mnuchin, he started talking, like, when he was initially talking about crypto. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, the treasury secretary is talking about crypto. And it was all bad. He was like, this is terrible, la la la. But he didn't really put that into any policy. And I thought it was interesting how it talks about, you know, there were initially these, um, uh, attempts to get working groups going. And you had all kinds of people, like you had Jack Dorsey trying to get in there. You had like people from all these, uh, top, companies in the industry trying to get together, that would have been interesting if that had happened. Obviously, COVID happened instead and no in-person things ended up uh, taking place. But it would have been like an interesting what if scenario if those working groups had taken place. Maybe Mnuchin would have learned a little bit more about crypto and then at the very last hour of his tenure wouldn't have tried to, to sweep through really bad stuff for crypto. I mean, it's like comparing Mnuchin to the Biden administration, I mean, Gensler is so much worse. Like it was kind of good that Mnuchin didn't really know much about crypto. He just didn't get it. So he didn't really know what to pass and then just tried to slide things through. Gensler knows just enough to be dangerous. So he's just like hating on crypto and attacking it and going after it, which is so much worse than anything Mnuchin did, uh, which I think is just an interesting comparison. But Christy, I'll throw it to you for your take. What, what did you get from all of this like ridiculous amount of documentation? Well, a lot of what you just said, but honestly, I, I, I have to say, I thought it was kind of funny that Jared Kushner was the one who first brought stable coins to the attention of the administration. He's not the guy I would have expected to have started that whole email train of, hey, we should look into stable coins. Um, but apparently he was the guy. Uh, so that that was the one that kind of stuck out to me as sort of the fun fact. Maybe not the most, um, I don't know, earth shaking discovery, but definitely a fun thing to find out that, yeah. Kushner was a stablecoin man. <laughs> Jen? Uh, I, so one fun fact that I want to touch on since Naomi mentioned Jack Dorsey was it was upsetting that he didn't get a plus one to, <laughs> to that meeting. So there were some emails that came out where Jack Dorsey's team requested that he bring a plus one because several other leaders of other of crypto companies were allowed a plus one and he was unfortunately rejected. But one of the nuggets I focused on um, from this report, which I think was fantastic, was how the US government looked at and continues to look at global crypto policy. So there's a reference made to an email sent from U the Ukraine's deputy minister of digital transformation. And he's concerned that major US crypto exchanges pulled out of the country. And so the reason uh, that was cited by one of the exchanges was that they couldn't identify C Crimea residents specifically, and therefore they were at risk of violating sanctions. And this is just so unfortunate to me. I think this is something that continues to happen. The 44 million people, citizens of the Ukraine lose out on this technology and, and these financial products because the US regulatory system is just so broad and vague. And that's something we continue to see. So it's just 
that was the one upsetting piece that I took away from that to balance off the really fun pieces. But Naomi, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, and it wasn't just U.S. regulatory framework. It was global. You know, you've got FATF, mm-hmm. you've got global sanctions against, you know, anyone who seems to have profited from the annexing of the Crimea. And so it's, yeah, it's interesting that this kind of resonates in the crypto world as well. Um, I, I agree with you, Jen. Like, it's just sad to see people losing out when governments start to play these games with each other and we're like, well, we don't like your administration. So the people who live in your country all suffer as a result. Like it's just really sad and they play these games all the time. But I'll throw it to you, Zach, for your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about public documents is that, you know, they're public. It took nine months for Coindesk to obtain these documents. Uh, some of them were redacted, but much of what was provided is, you know, your elected official, officials uh, hard at work or not day in, day out. And that's the beauty of the of the, of the FOIA is that you get to sort of get this un uh, previously closed door to what was going on behind the scenes is now open. And it's interesting to see just how, regulators here and here over the last few years have really started to grapple with cryptocurrency and what these technologies can mean for the world and their economies so it's gonna be interesting to see maybe in a few years time we'll be able to get some some biden administration documents out, out on the record and it's gonna be interesting to see if the conversation has evolved or if it's still largely the same questions i'll toss this to naomi for your last thoughts Yeah, I just think that it's also interesting to look at these documents and see how much of their time is actually spent understanding crypto, learning about it, because someone like the Treasury Secretary is being pulled in a million different directions, is grappling with all kinds of different policies. And the amount of time spent on crypto, you know, it's very small compared to like how much time is spent in other areas. And these are the people who are determining policy that affect, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Um, and yet they just don't, they don't take the time to understand this because they don't have the time. And yet we're putting all of this power in their hands to be able to shape this industry, to determine this industry that they clearly don't understand. I I think that's a very interesting point to to think about as well like why we're giving these these people so much power to determine uh what we're allowed to do in our everyday lives but let's change track here we're going to actually go uh to some news let me i've got to scroll through like 75 pages of these freedom of information <laughs> documents like coin desk all right we're there now uh so Signal, big news from Signal. It is the most private messaging app uh, in the opinion of many cybersecurity experts. And the CEO has stepped down. Moxie Marlinspike, he is an incredible uh, thought leader. He has done so much for privacy. He's an original cypherpunk and he built Signal and has decided, you know, after a decade of working on this, he's going to take a break. Uh, He wrote this really nice post that kind of illuminates how much work goes into these things, how difficult difficult it is to keep these systems up and running, how much of a toll it takes, saying that, you know, he's going to take a break from this, but uh, he's going to remain on Signal's board. And meanwhile, Brian uh, Brian Acton is going to step up. I, I have some stuff that I want to dive into about Brian Acton, um, but I'm going to throw it to the group to start off with uh, for your thoughts. And then, I'll, then we'll dive into that backstory, which I think is super interesting that many people might not be aware of. But Christy, I'll throw to you to start off with. I think that um, he's got some really good ideas. Um, I think that Signal has been a great asset, especially for, say, journalists who want to do have some private encrypted uh, conversations. Um, the thing with what I'm interested in is where he's going to go next. He has many, many thoughts that he has come out with about Web3 and the not so much decentralized processes that go on behind the scenes in Web3 that Web3 is being built on. So maybe he'll take more of an active role there. We don't know. He says he's going to be stepping down gradually over the month. And, you know, maybe by the time they find themselves a new CEO, he'll have more definite plans. But I'm really curious to see where that ends up. Jen, I saw your hand up. Right you. Yeah, in the blog post, he talks about, you know, really like building Signal up from its infant days. You know, he did all the jobs. He sat out in the rain with his laptop, you know, troubleshooting server issues. And it takes a lot 
from a CEO who has gone through all of that to understand when it's time to let go. I think I said the same thing when Jack Dorsey stepped down. So I think I think this is taking a lot from him. But if we can draw parallels to what happened to Jack Dorsey when he stepped down from, from Twitter, you know, he's really focusing on his passion now and building out these ecosystems around Bitcoin and, and Web3. And so Christy, to your point, I'm really interested to see um, where he goes next. But Naomi, I'll throw it back up to you. Yeah, I think the big takeaway from this article, um, when he's talking about building this up, I mean, he said, um, actually, I want to go back to your, your point, um, Christy, in talking about decentralization of Web3, because I think it ties back to what makes Signal so special, is his Web3 article where he wrote this blog post saying, this is not decentralized, guys, be really aware of what you're actually getting involved with. His big point was people don't want to run their own service. And this is just true. People don't want to run their own service. So what we end up with is this centralization of everyone's calling on the same thing, uh, these same hubs who kind of like control this. They are big focal points of potential failure there or, or censorship or control. Um, and people need to be be aware of that. Now, what makes services like Signal so important is you have all these privacy people out there who are like, oh, the only truly private thing is if you run your own server and you have to do this. And most people are going to be like, oh, I'm just going to give up and just kind of use Facebook instead. You know, it's too difficult. And what Signal does is it says, listen, and this is what um, Moxie talks about in his article. He says, listen, the point is that we're going to tend towards centralized infrastructure. The point isn't to try to decentralize the infrastructure, it's to make it secure enough so it doesn't matter if it's centralized. And that's what Signal did. It brought privacy to the masses because it made it easy enough and it took all that data out of the hands of even the people running the servers. It says you won't even get access to this information. So it doesn't matter if it's it, you know somewhat centralized in that regard because these servers, this company doesn't have any access to information. So Signal brought this amazing user experience, brought privacy to the masses masses. Um, and privacy is really only valuable when it's scalable in this way, because if you're not, if you don't have someone on the other end of your message willing to also be private with you, you know, that your message isn't private. If you're sending from ProtonMail, you're sending it to Gmail, Google's reading everything that you said, regardless of you opting into ProtonMail. It's about, you know, bringing this to the masses. But what I wanted to dive into with Brian Acton, so he's the one who is now taking over as interim CEO. Uh, so WhatsApp was actually co-founded by Brian Acton. A lot of people probably aren't aware of that history. Um, he was very well known at the time for being super privacy focused while he was running it. So, for example, WhatsApp famously didn't keep logs of uh, user conversation. Um, and then they turned on encryption for a billion users. They brought encryption to the mainstream. Like WhatsApp did an incredible job. Now, in 2014, WhatsApp was sold to Facebook and it was the largest ac acquisition uh, by Facebook at that time. Brian Actum immediately became really unhappy with the direction the app was moving in. So all the people out there who were like, oh, WhatsApp's really encrypted. Well, the guy who founded it was like, actually, this is not what I want uh, in an app. I'm really unhappy with this. He was so unhappy that in 2017, he had all these uh, vested, uh, unvested options on the table, $850 million worth that were about to come to fruition in like a month. He was so unhappy, he left $850 million on the table because he just wanted to leave. Right? Wow. This is how, like, this is how unhappy he was with the director. So what he did was he took $50 million of the money he had. He gave it straight to the private messaging competitor, Signal, which Moxie had established with the, the Signal Foundation. And the two of them set up this Signal Foundation. And then they've just been focused on actually building out private messaging. And I love this story because it's just like a big, you know, middle finger up to, to Facebook and companies that take private things and move it in a direction that actually compromises user data. Like they were so principled in this. And I just, I just really love this story. So I wanted to mention it. And this is the man who will be taking over from Moxie. So although I'm super sad to see Moxie leave Signal, he will still be on the board. Uh, and Moxie has just does, done such amazing stuff uh, for privacy for all of us. So thank you for your service, sir. And uh, Brian Acton, I think is going to do a tremendous job as well. And we'll see who takes over as the actual CEO once they find a replacement. But uh, I will throw it to you, Zach, for some final thoughts. Yeah, that Moxie guy, he, I don't know, he's an interesting character. He was involved with the mobile coin project. He has mm -hmm. various reservations mm -hmm. about crypto and Web3. He may have been the CTO of the mobile coin project, according to, according to some uh, early documentation out of that team. So he remains an enigmatic character within the crypto space. And I'm with Christy. I'm curious to see where he goes next. All right, let's take a break. Let's pause. When we get back, we're going to talk about taxes, crypto taxes, tax bit, partnering with some big name exchanges on some tax stuff. 
stick with us. We're going to talk about that after the break. Uh, it's the hash. Hey, good stuff. Hey. What's up, everybody? This is Spencer Dinwiddie. And I'm Solo Cisse. And this is New Money, brought to you by Coindesk. All I hear, go get the money. So I go get it. Hate means I do something right. So I'm a let him. Yeah, I'm a let him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a let him. I hit the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah, I'm a let him. What we'll see is money not only being exchanged for this digital currency, but the frictionless movement across borders. It's gonna be able to flow as easy as a text message. Staying true to yourself, right? Like, you've always been true to yourself. I just wanna share that with everybody. You know, you could be yourself in full capacity. It's our duty to take our visions and be fearless in our pursuit. Be my most authentic self and show people that, look, I'm an athlete, and yes, I'm also a part of the LGBT community. My goal is to have, you know, my own NFT, my own entire IP, like my own everything. You know, how do you think, you know, blockchain and crypto impacts the way you think about it? Well, I think everyone has like some sort of like, so like, uh, how'd you get Bitcoin? It's like asking someone if they smoke. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like, yo. <laughs> Embracing where the world is going. And when the whole world shut down, we saw just how important tech was. It was more so of my style and the foods that I cooked that kind of pushed me. I wanted to live the lifestyle of an athlete or an artist while doing what I love. Having that open mind, having that, that flexibility, just allows you to be of, of so much more service to, you know what I'm saying, youth or society in general. Gamers, you know, maybe it's because you guys just hustle different. Anything you want to be great at, you got to put hours and hours in every single day. Hello and welcome back to The Hash. I have to say that show, New Money, looks really cool. When does it premiere? Tomorrow. Yay, I'm excited. Okay, here is something Ooh. less cool. Taxes. We are talking about taxes. Taxbit is offering Ooh. free tax filing tools to users of Coinbase, PayPal, FTX US, and more. Users can access tax forms starting today through participating platform apps or Taxbit Network's website. Taxbit CEO Austin Woodward said he wants to make the software accessible when it comes to ease of use and cost. So Naomi, I'm throwing this right down to you to kick us off. What do you think of this? We are, we're making tax accounting easy to access for... Uh, people with any amount of transactions and any amount of tra any transaction size. What do you think of this product? So, uh, you just you just got poke the bear, don't you, Jen? You just got. I know. So I'm like taxes. Thoughts. I mean, Who on the one hand, taxes? completely against completely against taxation. It's a way to fund this uh, awful state that creates all these atrocities, goes bombs, you know, children in Syria. Like I am not for anything that is, enables the government to leverage money to commit these atrocities. On the other side of things, uh, people do use tax as a reason not to use crypto. They say that it's too difficult mm -hmm. and they're worried and all of that. So I do think that it, uh, like, I mean, I've been filing crypto taxes for a long time now, uh, as much as I hate taxation as a general principle, uh, because when someone puts a gun to your head and forces you to do something, you should probably do it. And so the fact that they're creating tools to make this easier for people, I think is definitely helpful. And I think that people should stop using taxation as a reason why they shouldn't be embracing cryptocurrency in their everyday life because it's actually really easy to do this stuff. Uh, and with tools like this, it becomes even more easy. I think a lot of people, you know, they're, they're just not interested in incorporating crypto in their everyday life uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they just dug their heels in. Maybe they don't like change. Maybe they just like talking the talk on Twitter and getting a lot of likes and not actually walking the walk. Um, there's a, a lot of people out there like that. Uh, so they do kind of hold up this this flag and say like, oh, Oh, I would, but taxation stops me. It doesn't. Uh, there are so many people out there who are using crypto and just filing their taxes and it's super easy. So yeah, it's interesting that they're providing simple tools for this and uh, I'd be interested to see how simple uh, they are. But I'll, uh, I'll throw to you, Zach, for your thoughts. Yeah, you got to keep it simple, stupid. And I think this is the way to do it, right? You make it easy for these exchanges to provide users with tax documentation. I think it's a boon for the space. Uh, taxes, yeah, they're, they're, they're the boogeyman. They're, they're scary. People don't really know what to make of it all. A lot of folks are daunted by it. So the ability to have this sort of uh, 
baked into the exchange experience on the crypto side, just as it, uh, as it would be with, you know, your brokerage account um, at, you know, Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever. I think that's going to be hugely helpful to people as they try to reckon with how scary or not scary the tax man can be when it comes to crypto. So uh, the fact that all these companies are signing up with Taxbit here is pretty interesting. And I'm just, yeah, it, 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 it was a bit of a bombshell that all these people were involved. Must have been pretty crazy hurting all those cats. So um, congrats to the team over there. It'd be curious to see uh, what comes of it. But yeah, Krista, your thoughts. Well, the, my, my first thought is, of course, when Canada, uh, it's all lovely that so many <laughs> yes, of these, uh, these sorts of uh, services are available to Americans. And that's lovely. And I don't I mean, I'm assuming because I'm seeing Binance US in the article and I'm not seeing that it is an international thing, that this is a US mm -hmm. only offering um, as a Canadian who has had to file multiple, mm -hmm. multiple returns of um, of crypto income, years of crypto income. Um, I used to be paid entirely in Bitcoin for a few years, and that was a fun time yeah. trying to trying to uh, f gather all of the things together. I think the important thing is it's not just a matter of, hey, crypto is less scary. You should use it because it's not so hard to pay your taxes or file your taxes. But also for those of us who have been filing taxes on crypto gains, losses, um, knowing that when we send it in at the end of the day that we're not sort of screwing ourselves over and and paying too much or not paying enough or not claiming things that we thought we were supposed to claim or vice versa it's the questions and the um sort of the peace of mind. I think that's very cool. On the other hand, you're also dealing with large centralized exchanges. And for those people who maybe are more DIY, it's a little less um, helpful. So in a way, it's, it's almost like advertising for the services that are involved. It's like a bonus. If you use our services, you're going to get this benefit, which I'm not faulting them for, but it does sort of centralized in that. Uh, Naomi, your hand went back up. Yeah, I do want to have add a caveat though. Um, when I say like, it's not so hard to file your taxes. It's not, but do keep in mind that the government really hasn't got a concrete policy around how crypto taxes should be managed. There's a lot of talk about this. There are a lot of presumptions. You talk to an accountant, they'll tell you, oh, probably this, but might also be this, and we have no way of knowing. Like, it's, it's, it's actually pretty um, uh, vague. Uh, all of the rules around this. There'll be situations where you'll be like, okay, well, I got this thing there and I staked it in this. I used the derivative there, but I never actually had access to the funds, but now I'm staking it. And the account will be like, I have no idea exactly. what you're talking about. Right? So it like it, this type of stuff could be interesting. If, if tax bidders got this stuff figured out and they have a formula and software, you can plug those things in and it spits out like what you owe. That would be very interesting. I very much doubt that they have it concrete though, because the government hasn't got a concrete at the moment yeah. and the people yeah. who are in control of you know looking at our taxes aren't even going to understand what you're writing about so like this is a like it's an interesting world at the moment but Jen I'll, I'll throw it to you I think I saw Zach's hand go up and then I think Christy has our last story yeah just a quickie you know Taxbit does have the ear of the IRS to some extent you know back in May of last year they announced they got a year a year contract to uh help do crypto tax auditing for the Internal Revenue Service so uh maybe they're providing some clarity to the IRS on how it should be all done anyway Christy let's go just one final thing I wanted to point out is that in February next month, there will be a whole theme week on Coindesk devoted to taxes, not just American taxes, but we're going to be getting all kinds of cool insights. So be sure to uh, check out Coindesk uh, during the month of February to find out tax all week. the tax information that you're going to need. And I'm Ooh, now imagine going to... I won't be invited to that. You tax me. <laughs> <laughs> I keep making me far away. She's not allowed to say anything. She'll just rile it. It's the government for hours. Naomi will not anyway. be on the show Christy. during tax week. I will not be on the show. Protest. In protest. No, we'll have to bring you in special, <laughs> Naomi. <laughs> 
So finally, last story today, I believe, is we're talking about Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is an NFT-based online video game, pay to play, play, pay, well, pay to play, play to earn, which uses Ethereum-based cryptocurrencies, Axie Infinity shards, AXS is your ticker. Um, and there's a new research report from blockchain analytics firm Nansen that suggests that Ronin, a layer two product from Axie Infinity devoted solely to the game, is processing more transactions than up and coming networks such as Avalanche and Phantom. In fact, at its peak in November, Ronin processed 560% more tran total transactions that month than the Ethereum blockchain did. Now, note, We've got here, all these are layer one protocols that we're comparing Ronin to. Ronin is a layer two protocol and it's designed, presumably, it's it's like a, um, a scaling layer on top of Axie that deals with all of this transaction uh, traffic going on on the game. So Axie Infinity has right now something like 2.8 million active daily users. And as a result, Ronin, it's layer two uh, scaling uh, product is processing 40% more transactions than Avalanche, which is one of the most popular layer one protocols. That's like a base layer blockchain by transaction volume. And what's really cool about this is the fact that we're getting these concentrated blockchains that are working specifically on a particular task. In this case, we're talking about playing a game or a few games and having these scaling products on top of these blockchains is what's making them tick and keep up with all of the all of the traffic that they're getting as uh, as one um, analyst pointed out he said that if one single game demands so much of an underlying blockchain what happens when that chain is home to multiple games and that's what we're seeing on top of a lot of these layer one blockchains that are getting you know huge gas fees or whatever they they charge um and having uh, you know some throughput issues so i don't know i just thought that was kind of a neat thing uh, anybody uh want to chime in on that uh let's see zach quick... you never get to start off all right, I'll start it off. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the the context here, I think, is really important, right? Like, you're seeing a ton of hype around play to earn, around game five. There's all this investment in this space. There's still very few sort of actually like playable titles in that realm, but Axie Infinity is certainly like the crown jewel of that emerging sector. So to see data like this is really interesting. Uh, and notable, and also timely, because I mean, we saw po Polygon, the Matic network, was like jammed up like all last week because there was this one game called like sunflower farmers or something that like was just botting the network to the point where like users couldn't even log into to their polygon wallets so um you know these are still systems that are sort of being built as the plane is being flown and to get interesting sort of uh research and data on what may work as these systems look to scale to a mass audience is important, relevant, and uh, always worth reading if you ask me. So go read Andrew Thurman on this piece. A um, lot of good nuggets in there, but I think I saw Jen's uh, hand for her thoughts. Yeah, I just want to add some quick color. So Ronin processed 40% more transactions than Avalanche. And this was despite typhoon season in the Philippines. Now, 50% of <laughs> Axie's users are, are from the Philippines. I lived in the Philippines. I've lived through typhoon season. And there are power outages all the time. You often don't have access to the internet. So this was very, very surprising to me that they were able to achieve this le this level um, of transaction fees during during typhoon season in the Philippines. I think that just speaks to the amazing community and network around Axie. And, and maybe they are growing in users in other parts of the world. But Naomi, I'll pass it up to you. I, I I just wanted to point out that I think Jen has lived in every country in the world because every story <laughs> that comes out just says just it's interesting. I lived my age. in Quebec, Astanikan, Sukuba, Ban, and you're like, I didn't even know that was a cut. You've lived there. Okay, cool. That's cool, Jen. Uh, so I just want to throw that out. I think we're gonna have to like sit down, have a drink together. You got to tell me your life story because you know, there's you you've been to a lot of places. Zach, like, I'm gonna throw it back to you for a wrap. 
All right, let's wrap this thing up. Good times, everybody. Uh, that's the hash for today. We're going to be back for tomorrow's show. Uh, I'm Zach Seward. We are joined by Christy Harkin, Jen Sinassi, and Naomi Brockwell. We'll get you up to speed tomorrow on the Wednesday show. Thanks for tuning in on the Tuesday show. And yeah, I'm excited for that new show on Coindesk TV tomorrow. That yeah, looks pretty looks cool. So cool. And yeah. How the whole set is a green screen is like mind blowing to me. Anyway, good stuff. Check out New Money yeah, tomorrow. That's cool. Look at with that graphic. All those great folks. Look at, that, look at that graphic. Purple. Look at that. Yellow. With I, the know, pink. I know. Spencer Dinwiddie is on the show. Mm-hmm. Come on, man. That's, mm. that's some good stuff. All right. Check that out tomorrow. Stick with us for the hash tomorrow at the same time, same place. We'll see you then. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks.